Hey everybody, it's Gauntletax, and welcome to the Lost Caverns of Ixalan Arena Open Day 2. In today's video, we'll be competing in a best of three draft of the Lost Caverns of Ixalan with the goal of winning at least three out of the four rounds. If we can accomplish that, we will qualify for the day two draft number two, where there's up to $2,000 in cash prizes on the line. Without further ado, let's hop into the draft and see where the cards take us today. All right, here we are for our pack one, pick one out of the event. I think this is a pretty easy Spyglass Siren, just so much value for such a cheap mana cost here. Great evasive threat. Other options are Get Lost and Triumphant Chomp for solid monocolored cheap efficient removal. We also have an Axe Draw for great value play in green, but there's also the Seed Stones filling a similar role, giving you a two for one by being a pump spell and then a nice big way to stabilize later. I think these are all super solid cards that I'm mentioning here. I just think that Spyglass Siren is one of the best uncommons in the format. It's pretty absurd for that really, really low mana cost, and it has a lot of great synergies with artifact mechanics, with the pirate creature type. A lot of stuff this card does phenomenally well for a really low mana cost. So we'll take the Siren here. Anything to really keep an eye on here in terms of what might wheel? Not really. I think there's a small enough amount of playables that Axe Draw, Chomp, and Get Lost are going to be gone, and then there's not going to be much left in the pack. So just start with the Spyglass Siren there, be pretty happy with it. For pick two, we've got a couple different places to go. We could stick to blue with the Inverted Iceberg, which does send a pretty good signal to stay off of blue, because then there's no blue playables in the pack. I don't think Relic's Roar is very good. We could take Petrify for efficient removal. Tomb Raider to head into Blue Red Pirates, which is a great aggressive strategy, and it works well with the Siren. Or we could take the Tarion's Journal as just the strongest card. It's a good value play over the course of a long game. That does put us into a potential black strategy, though, which is one of the weaker colors to immediately tie yourself into. But if you have a really good reason to, like a powerful rare, like the Tarion's Journal, it is still worth it. I think I like taking the Coward's Path like I usually do. And when we've got a super reasonable, super solid on-color card, I'm going to stick to it and take the Inverted Iceberg here. Fits really well into every single blue deck in the format. Works great with the Siren. Let's scoop it up. Pick number three now. There's a Sunfire Torch towards blue-red, which is pretty fine. Sunscribe is fine in blue-white because you care about having a lot of artifacts, so having your two drops be artifact creatures is reasonable there. Eaten by Piranhas is okay. It's not great. But blue doesn't get much for like hard removal, so it's what you kind of get out of the main color in your deck if you are heavy blue. I think those are the big picks here. Eaten by Piranhas, the Torch, and the Sunscribe, really. I mean, Glorifier can be fine with a ton of cheap flyers to put the counters onto and a ton of, ex a ton of expendable uh, artifacts and creatures to sack. But you got to put in a lot of work to get that Glorifier playable, because it says a 3-mana three 3-2 three, without doing something when it hits the board. It's quite bad. I think I'm just going to keep locking people out of blue. I don't think Eaten by Piranhas is that much worse than just taking like a Sunscribe here. I think it's a decent bit worse than the Torch, but this way we get to stick to one color for now. Now pick four, we can move into blue-green potentially, the scout being an excellent value play. A one mana one one that draws you a card, or a one mana two two that surveils. Really, really efficient. Quite a bit better than the River Herald Scout, which would be the on-color pick, but the plus side of taking the River Herald Scout is once again plas passing almost no blue playables. I mean, Brian Fang and Echo are moderately playable and really slow blue decks, so specifically like blue-black and blue-green, they can be okay. But River Herald Scout is the only card that I would put into almost any blue deck in this format. Yeah, Scout. Well, we're taking one of the two Scouts. The Sent Out Scout or the River Herald Scouts. You know, I guess we don't really have to commit to a second color. It's not like the Scout, the Sent Out Scout, is a bomb or anything. It's just really efficient. Take the River Herald. Pick five. Blue's got a lot of solid artifacts and cheap ways to spit out map tokens, so Waylaying Pirates is pretty consistent when you're heavy into blue to stun a thing. And that keeps people off of blue still from there. We could also take the Guardian of the Great Door and head into blue-white just as a big finisher. 
possible to cast this for pretty cheap as long as you have double white on board. You will need to tap a bunch of creatures and artifacts and stuff you have on board to do it, but that's not super hard. Guardian could be a solid off-color pick, but I've loved Waylaying Pirates in like every blue deck. We're just going to be mono blue. Pick number six now. Volatile Wanderglyph I like a lot actually in blue-red because it's that artifact creature type and being able to consistently filter through your cards and find what you need with its attack ability is actually quite nice. I think this is just my favorite card in the pack, but the Skullcap Snail is also reasonable for black. These two are the solid options, I think. Could take Hoverstone Pilgrim for the sideboard for pretty narrow matchups, but I'll take the Wanderglyph here now that the main blue card isn't super playable. Okay, Ancestor's Aid is a perfectly reasonable playable in blue. It's going to get an artifact into your graveyard to craft your artifacts like the Inverted Iceberg while being a perfectly reasonable draw spell early in the game. And a good card type to have. Pick 8. Kind of nothing here. I guess we could sideboard a Hurl into History in and out since these are best of 3 drafts. If we're playing against exactly like green-red dinos or maybe green-black, this might be okay. The vast majority of matchups it just doesn't play well, but I'm pretty much never going to even side in a Relic's Roar. The other cards are maybe Spike Tail if we end up in blue-black, maybe Blade Master if we're blue-red and we just need some filler. I'm going to take the Hurl into History for the sideboard. Pick nine now. Nothing playable for red or blue. Could take a Captivating Cave for potential fixing or a Death Cap Marionette for a reasonable early black spell. For the Descend kind of archetypes. I think I'd take the Cave here. Pick number 10. Skullcap Snail. In the Presence of Ages is fine in green. Instant Speed card draw. I think black's seeming a tiny bit more open than green with that late marionette. We'll take the skull cap here. Now a pirate hat, super filler, Nars, super filler, but so are the two white spells. Take the on-color card. We got the Brine Fang and the Echo back, so really good signs for blue. These were the only cards we left in this pack. In our main color. The Echo is probably moderately better than Brine Fang. Take a Cave Worm. If we get a lot of self mill, these can be reasonable beat sticks. And we're wheeling all the Cave Worms we left in the packs, too. I think I'd take that over the Pilgrim. Alright, well, blue is super open. Now we take breaches and we're blue-red pirates here. We should be able to get almost every blue pirate we see in the draft pod, and getting a powerful rare like breaches is as good a reason as any to commit to a secondary color. We don't need to find too many red spells throughout this draft to have a perfectly playable deck, because this only requires one red source to get cast. So we only need like four or five red spells and we'll just play... 10 islands, 7 mountains. Be perfectly happy with our deck being deep into blue. I think it's breaches. Try to get really lucky and wheel the Oaken Siren. I doubt blue is that open, but we might wheel the River Herald Scout since we got like every blue card back. Someone might take the uh, River Herald Scout, and if there's really, really a low quality or not the River Herald Scout, someone might take the Oaken Siren, and if there's really a low quantity of blue drafters in the pod, then the Scout might come back to us, so we'll see. But I'm taking Breaches here. Unfortunately, no playable blue cards were just opened in this pack at all. Somebody took a common... Could have been... Any common. I mean, maybe it was a playable blue common. We found the other blue drafter here. So we take the Scythe Claw Raptor, just really efficient for the cost. Three mana, four, three beat stick, I think is fine. We could take Spring Loaded Saw Blades. I mean, this card is pretty insane. If white looks more open than red, it's not as strong as Breaches, but if white is significantly more open than red, then this card is still really, really powerful. Being able to blow up a creature and turn into a very efficient vehicle, crewing for only one to become a 5 5. 
Sawblades is a very good card. I think it's just enough better than Raptor to speculate towards white on that. Okay, there's a Waylaying Pirates for another pirate, but hopefully that can come back around and we take a red spell here like an Idol of the Deep King, which is reasonable in the blue-red color pair. We should have plenty of artifacts on board to craft for this thing, and if we can craft it, slap it onto a little flyer like a Spyglass Siren, then that's pretty great. Scallywag's just okay. I mean, if you have a million volatile Wanderglyphs to keep discarding permanents and drawing cards, then Scallywag can pretty consistently hit treasures for you, but... I don't know. I think Breaches is plenty good even just by himself. I don't really think we need a super high pirate count to go for Scallywag over the idol here when we have no burn. Let's take the idol. Waterwind Scout, love to see it. Gotta take that over Goblin Tomb Raider because it is just so, so, so good. Sadly, the Tomb Raider is definitely not going to wheel blues way more open than red, but the Scout's not going to wheel either. There only has to be one blue player in this trap pot other than us, and this card is gone because it's better than every other card in this pack. Eh, arguably. Most of the other cards, at least. Another Iceberg here, pretty happy with that. These red spells are not great, and the Brine Fang is not great, so we'll take another nice uh, filler draw spell early that turns into our finisher at 6 mana. Card plays very well. Okay. Could go for a Sunscribe here towards blue-white, considering I don't think we want a fourth Cave Worm or a second Echo or anything. I guess we lack a lot of interaction here, so a Song of Stupefaction could be a thing. This probably comes back. Let's just take the Sunscribe in case we get really pushed to whites. It's unlikely. Okay, this pack is bad. We just take the 1 mana 2 damage burn, which isn't great because it is sorcery speed, but it is what it is. We gotta fill the deck with some amount of interaction. How many merfolk do we have for this pilgrimage? We need a lot for it to be good. We only have two right now, and it's not that likely to get enough. So we take an unlucky drop here. Could also take the waterlogged hulk towards mono blue descend with a bunch of cave worms, I guess. But I gotta get some interaction in here. Let's take the unlucky drop. We got the oaken siren back. Pick nine, it went across the entire draft pod because we cut blue so heavily in pack one. That is surprising. So there was one other blue drafter at this table, or there is one other blue drafter at this table. Somebody took a River Herald Scout over the Oaken Siren. I think if there were two blue drafters, though, they'd both be gone. So blue is looking real open generally. Got one cave. Really unlikely the cave in gets there, but I just don't think Child of the Volcano is going to get into this deck over even just cave worms. Iron Paw Aspirant, definitely more exciting than the Reminiscence. But Reminiscence is more likely to make the cut, since we're definitely blue. I'll take that Aspirant here. I still don't think I'm going to play just an exclusively draw spell in this deck. Sage of Days is not unplayable when you have Triple Cave Worm if we end up actually running those. Uh, but we're hoping to find better cards than that in the end. <laughs> Quadruple Cave Worm. Alright, pack three. Show us a bomb. No bomb. Ooh. This was a pretty disgusting pack to open, because Didact Echo and Child of Volcano are both really inefficient cards. They're just not good at all in our main colors. We can take a Cartographer's Companion, I guess, because we've got Artifact, Map Token Synergies, potentially. Or we can grab a White Spell like a Tinker's Tote. Rough. Yeah, this was an abysmal pack to open. Just a really bad blue spell, a really bad red spell, and that is it. In white, there's Tinker's Tote, which is solid, but nowhere near what we want to be opening for a pick one. Really disappointing pack. I'll take the Tinker's Tote, I guess. Pick two now. Blunder's pretty efficient interaction. I think that is reasonable, but Sunfire Torch is also a pretty efficient little burn spell. We've got to be attacking to get it going, but I think we can do that. 
Let's grab a Sunfire Torch here. Maybe we can get the Council of Echoes to come back, but the other Blue Drafter probably takes that if they're taking cards like River Herald Scout over Oaken Siren. Means they'll probably be a little better at filling that grave for the descents. They probably take Council and give us the blunder. Either way, we're getting something back here if there is truly just one other blue player. So let's take the Sunfire Torch. Shipwreck Sentry's pretty filler. Miner's Guidewing's actually really, really efficient, and Duskrow's Reliquary is very solid removal. Blademaster's also super filler. I'm probably specking white again here. There is that possible blue-white build instead of blue-red. Got the saw blades instead of the three different burn spells. Mm. I think I take the 1-1 one, one flyer with the plus one plus one counter stuff of the aspirant map tokens and stuff over the uh, little removal spell. Yeah, I mean, that's an abuelo. I can flicker Spyglass Sirens, River Herald Scouts, Water Wind Scouts for map tokens or exploration. I can flicker Tinker's Totes for more 1 1s. I can flicker Icebergs to mill and draw again. I can flicker a Saw Blades to do more damage. Abuelo is definitely a card. Now we get a Petrify out of the white for better removal than pretty much all the red removal we managed to pick up. And now instead of getting access to Torch, Chomp, and Idle, we get access to saw blades and petrify, slightly lower in quantity, but the quality is really there with these two removal spells. I think I take the petrify here, which is sad because there is a great red spell with the tomb raider, but I think this abuelo pivot has gotten us onto blue white. Maybe we can still run the captivating cave to slam some amount of red removal if we want, or just splash in a breaches. But we don't have any treasures or anything. I guess I could play the Buried treasure, but that's probably not ideal. Let's get another Waylaying Pirates in here. Probably cut the four copies of Cave Worm and have these at the four mana slot. I think that looks solid. There's a Master's Guide Mural. Very, very reasonable card, especially for best of three where things do slow down a little bit. Five mana for a 4-4, four, four, and if we make it to seven mana, this is definitely a win condition. Spinning out a 4-4 four, four every turn we play an artifact. Really happy with that. A little sad to pass up a Whirlpool and an Eaten by Piranhas for it, though. But we do have Petrify, Saw Blades, Eaten by Piranhas, and Unlucky Drop. We have some amount of interaction. We're not just dead in the water. Quantity of creatures is 12, plus a Guide Mural, plus a Tote, plus two Icebergs. So kind of like 16. Which I think is enough to go ahead and take a Deconstruction Hammer over an Intensive Sunscribe because it plays really well on our three cheap flyers, our Guide Wings and our two different Sirens that we have. And there's plenty of artifacts and enchantments for it to randomly blow up, which can happen. Another Didact Echo. If we end up in like a really grindy matchup, I suppose this could come in. We got the Blunder and the Council of Echoes back. You know, I actually think I want the cheap interaction a little more to take the blunder over the council. We do already have double iceberg for six mana six sixes and a guide mural now for a constant four four producer. So I'll take the blunder. I mean, council does synergize with Abuelo, but if I've cast both of those cards in a game, I'm probably already in a winning position. I don't love any of this. I'll take the sentry. Fine filler little attacker. Now we get another waylane pirates. Glorifier might be solid. We've got the tote for it. Throw some counters on some cheap flyers. Just really hate it when I don't have something to sack. But I guess I will try out the Glorifier in here with the three cheap flyers. And we've got two three mana flyers as well. So we have five flyers that cost three or less. Okay. Well. I don't know. This looks pretty solid to me. We've got a little bit of everything you want. A little bit of removal, some cheap flyers, a solid curve, a little bit of endgame with some six drops, the seven mana flipper. Just a little bit of everything here, really. Maybe if we went deeper onto blue-white over blue-red from early, we would have had the best deck possible in this draft pod. Maybe if I stuck Mega Glued to Blue-Red as soon as I took the Breaches, we would have had a slightly more consistent deck. These are possibilities. 
I think this is a really reasonable deck to have ended up with out of this draft pod, though. Not unhappy with that at all. Yeah. Let's cut five cards here. And head into the gameplay. Five cuts to be made here. I think we just bring the Echoes in in super grindy matchups. These are super bad against aggressive decks. They can often hit us with a two power one mana creature. Either something like a Siren or a Guidewing that has a hammer on it or a plus one plus one counter on it from exploring. Uh, or just one mana two twos like the Scout out of green that can explore when it hits the board. Or the Goblin Pirate in red. That's a one mana two two haste. So even though it is a two-for-one piece of value hitting the board, drawing you a card immediately, it often trades down so far in mana against aggressive strategies that it plays really poorly there. So I think that's sideboard material if the matchup looks super grindy. And then it is a fun synergy with the Abuelo in those kinds of matchups. So we'll keep it in mind out of the side, but I don't think we can main deck that. Same with Sage of, D's, Sage of, D's, Sage of Days here. We're not really descending much, so we're not getting much value from just milling when this hits the board. Yeah, it is like a scry 3 when you play it, but the body is just bad for the mana cost for that low impact of an enter the battlefield effect, which is the same problem I have with Glorifier. If you aren't actually getting to trigger this thing, it can be very, very bad for you. But I think Glorifier, while it is going to be pretty much just as bad as Sage of Days a lot of the time, every now and then it'll pop off for us, which makes it probably like the... 23rd best card in this deck that ends up actually making it in in the end so we'll keep the glorifier in here i do think we have some decent cards to sack to it like an iron paw aspirants or a uh, gnome token or a map token so hopefully glorifier plays fine for us but that could also be a cut um pirate hat just pretty expensive to equip generally i guess we do have a few pirates in here so some of the cards we want to put it on it does only cost one to equip you, and there's five pirates. But we want to put this on our flyers, and two of those are pirates, three of them are not. The Spyglass Siren and the Oaken Siren, the non-pirates being the Guidewing, the Waterwind Scout, and the Abuelo. Yeah, I just prefer the Deconstruction Hammer. I don't think we have room for a bunch of equipment in here. Although we've also got one dedicated piece of card draw, which I don't think is really necessary in this deck. When we have a couple cards like Inverted Iceberg that are drawing us one card when we play them, the Puzzle Door that is a dedicated piece of early card draw, and a good amount of Explorer and Map tokens between the Scout, the Spyglass Siren, and the Waterwind Scout. I always uh, default to calling these Scouts, and then I realize that they're both Scouts, so... The River Herald Scout and the Waterwind Scout are both giving us Map tokens. The Spyglass Siren is giving us a Map token. The Guidewing is exploring... And that kind of stuff so all these cards are, are potentially a little bit of card advantage as well so with enough of that plus with a bunch of artifacts we can craft between the iceberg the guide mural and the saw blades those are also built in two for ones i don't think we need a spell strictly dedicated to card draw so that leaves us with the last two cuts really being the eaten by piranhas or the pirate hat mainly or maybe the glorifier i think it is probably the weakest creature i've been growing less and less impressed with this as time goes on because i've been drawing it in positions where i'm <laughs> not getting any counters out out of it uh relatively more consistently so this could be awkward yeah i think we cut one of these three cards and call it a deck i don't think we quite want 18 lands but i don't hate the idea of 18 lands here with a bunch of map tokens and exploring to try to dig through any mana flood and uh, and draw draw those lands immediately we can try to speed run up to the six seven mana we need to flip these things and again we've got some six seven mana plays so i don't think 18 lands is horrible but i do think that probably 16 lands is pretty bad here with again the six and seven mana things to maybe be flipping but we might just meet it in the middle here and stick to the traditional 17 lands I'm going to start with the pirate hat in the side, keep the glorifier, and keep the eaten by piranhas. If nothing else, this is a fine way to get rid of their flying blockers. Make their flyer just a 1-1 one -one that can't block in the sky anymore, or make their reach creature just a 1-1 one -one that can't block anymore. Helps get the flyers in, which is a lot of what this color pair is doing really well in the early game. So we're getting a bunch of flying damage in, in the early game, grinding out a lot of value in the late game with a bunch of 2 for 1s, big threats as well. Deck looks pretty solid. Pretty solid for sure. 
another look at everything that we have in the sideboard. I think I'm cool with starting it all on the side, but there are several reasonable options to pull into the deck at the right time, and several options of cards that might play poorly in certain matchups. If we're in a really aggressive matchup, eaten by piranhas gets a lot worse when all of our opponent's creatures are like 1-1s to 3-3s anyway, and they're just trying to steamroll, send them all in really quick. That card can be weaker um, than maybe just a solid cheap blocker or something. Um, yeah, and then there's some matchups where, you know, it'll be really grindy and that Echoes will actually play well. Maybe some matchups where two fives are just really big blockers. Or some matchups where we need to be able to grind a little better, draw through our deck some more, and we can play the Pirate Hat there. Lots of reasonable options in the sideboard. Pretty big fan of that. Um, are our mana costs simple enough, easy enough to get to to just run the Captivating Cave here as a colorless land? I think they are. We don't have any double blue or double white spells until we have six mana. At that point, I will need double blue for the Inverted Iceberg to flip, or double white for the Guide Mural to flip. But I feel like we probably don't get punished too hard running one colorless land in the deck, and it does give us an alternate effect when we're flooding out to be able to put a couple of plus one plus one counters on the board, which can be pretty valuable using that on a flying threat. And the reason I refer to the Captivating Cave as a colorless source is because it's taxing you to get any colored mana out of it, which puts you pretty far behind in the game if you're casting two drops on turn three and three drops on turn four. So that is the big flaw of the cave. I don't actually like this much for, um, for two color decks. You basically never want to be filtering your mana through this thing, but... Because we don't have double blues and double whites, we're probably on a decent enough mana base that we don't need to do that often at all. And uh, we can just run this as Flood Prevention, so that's kind of nice there. I think it'll fit well into the deck, and I think this will be the final 40, and we'll call it a deck here. Alright, here's a look at the final deck list for today. We've drafted a nice, consistent blue-white deck. This is showing off everything that this archetype generally does in the format with some great efficient flyers that give us value as well, like the Miner's Guidewing exploring when it dies, the Spyglass Siren coming with a map token to explore as well, the Waterwind Scout doing the same, and the Oaken Siren being able to tap for some mana towards our artifacts, which is the other half of this sort of archetype. It starts with a lot of nice, efficient early game flyers and value plays like Explore Creatures with River Herald Scout, and tops it all off by flipping some big craft artifacts like the Inverted Icebergs, and the Master's Guide Mural. So pretty cookie cutter stuff from the archetype, but we have some cool things going on. We've got the Abuelo here, which can flicker our cards like Master's Guide Mural to just keep getting extra 4-4s, four which will be pretty nuts. But even with some of our smaller cards, we can get some decent value off of this, kind of get infinite blocks if we need to be chump blocking over and over. We can like chump with a Waterwind Scout and then flicker it and get another map token out of it. Little value plays like that are available with Abuelo as well, which is nice. And of course, just being a cheap little flyer that has ward means it's a perfectly reasonable card to start buffing up with our map tokens, our deconstruction hammer, and our other potential plus one plus one counter providers. So super solid stuff, looks pretty consistent, just about the average solid blue-white deck that you're going to see in this format, little bit of interaction with a Petrify, Spring-Loaded Saw Blades, Eaten by Piranhas for permanent removal, and then Brackish Blunder and Unlucky Drop for some temporary removal as well. Looks like a pretty solid deck, but we'll have to see how it does as we head into the gameplay. All right, here we are for game one with a keep here. It's a reluctant keep. We are really hoping the Sunscribe can get us out of any potential mana flood, but I doubt they're going to spend removal on the Sunscribe early. The only issue we could have is if they get a nice creature to trade off with this early in the game. Then we'll have some issues getting out of some mana flood potentially. But we can scribe probably at least once out of this guaranteed, and then if the Guidewing dies, we'll also explore, which can do a little digging. There's a risk here for sure, comparable to the risk of keeping like a one lander, but I think it's worth it to not take the mulligan to start things off here. We are on the play, which really helps the Sunscribe get going here quite a bit. Alright, opponent keeps a six card hand and rolls from there. Find the hammer for the guide wing, but I would rather get another creature on board so that we do get value from the Explore from the Guide Wing when it dies, if they immediately blow it up. We can drop the Hammer and equip it next turn if we don't draw anything better. Draw an Eaten by Piranhas, which is reasonable, but 
Not when there's nothing to kill. So let's get that buff and get the scry. And we can even move this hammer over to the sun scribe if they do establish a blocker big enough to stop it from getting those scries. Playing against blue, red, and green. Could be one of the really multicolored cave sort of strategies. We hit a spyglass siren, which is a beautiful draw. So if they block at all, we just eat and buy piranhas and the paleontologist dies without doing anything for them. And even if we don't, or even if they don't block, I think we're still going to eat and buy piranhas that to shut off their mana fixing. I think that is a fine play. Because it looks like they could use some ramp and fixing. There are at least three colors over there. Go for the buff on the guide wing if we can. And we do get it. River Herald Scout on top. Don't love that as a draw. I'm going to ditch that and then scry as well. Send in the squad. I will... Hmm, one power flyer. A decommission hammer. I don't hate it, but... Do I dig for something bigger? I feel like I dig for something bigger if we can keep the sun scribe around. Alright, they choose not to block, which means they almost definitely want the mana from the Paleontologist, so turning that into no longer a mana dork should be plenty helpful for us. We're hitting for 4 damage a turn in the sky, potentially. It's a 3 turn clock, even if they can block the Sun Scribe with their next creature. And they can block the Sun Scribe with their next creature. They hit a non-land off of it as well, which means that it will be big enough to survive the Sun Scribe even with a hammer on it. Here's where scrying the 1 2 flyer to the bottom ends up looking a little awkward. Yeah, especially hitting a land here. Get another scry off of the sun scribe. Just cash it in or just hold it. At least the eaten by piranhas would have been pretty bad against the axe draw, so there is that. I don't feel that bad about having used the eaten by piranhas already. I do feel bad about the scry, though. It did not pan out well. It's going to be a three-turn clock almost no matter what I draw into. I don't think there's anything I can draw into that gives plus two, plus two immediately. So yeah, I guess I don't scry here. Jam in and hold up the artifact enchantment removal from the decommission hammer. Still a two-turn clock after this, even if we sacrifice the hammer to clear out something. But it would have been a more consistent clock if we had an Oaken Siren on board as well. I think that was a bad scry choice. Send in the 5-4, certainly no blocks. And they're going to pass the turn with all this mana up. Could be multiple cheap burn spells like a braid. Could be Watley's final strike and staggering size style green tricks. There's a lot of issues that it could be. Tinker's Tote's not a bad draw, and we actually get to at least declare the attack with the Sun Scribe, even if something might happen to it right afterwards. So I'm going to spend three on the Tote. Could play the tote and destroy an artifact or enchantment with the guide wing with my six mana, so that is a small argument for keeping the equipment on the guide wing. I think there's a solid argument for moving it to the siren though, and that is that we will still hit them for two if they just removal spell my guide wing. But there's also two damage removal they could have, like Idol of the Deep King, two damage to any target, so. Mm. I guess I will just keep it on Guide Wing so I can play Tote and Sack the Hammer if nothing happens to the Guide Wing. And so Guide Wing is big enough to dodge two damage removal. Iceberg is a pretty solid draw here. It's a little slow to flip it, 
but we'll draw the card the turn we play it, so maybe draw into something else that we cast that turn, and then next turn we play the 6-6. Six, six. Okay, it's 4 damage on board. See their combat tricks here. Removal spells, maybe. Staggering size is the combat trick. Let me write that down real quick for game two. They do have staggering size in their deck for plus three, plus three trample at instant speed. Watley's final strike now to kill the guide wing. Which certainly is, so we'll keep that in mind. as well. Alright. I think this was still a fine line. Obviously we moved the hammer over. Would have gotten one more point of damage in here potentially. I mean I guess we still get that extra point of explore damage at least, which is nice. They are down to four, facing a three power flyer now. Two turn kill. But if I moved the hammer pre combat and they still chose to kill the hawk, I guess no. If I moved the hammer pre combat, they would have just killed the siren instead of the hawk, and then I would have still dealt two damage here. Because then I wouldn't have explored off of the deck of the death of my spyglass siren. No blocks, because if they don't play another creature here, we've got lethal attacking all. Ooh, panicked Altasaur for the big reach blocker. That's an issue. Glad to have a 6-6 coming up. Mill a land, draw a land. Well, you win some, you lose some there. Flip this iceberg next turn. For now, we're cracking a tote to gain some life. Having that tote in the graveyard for the iceberg. Don't think I'm moving the hammer at all. Once we flip a 6-6, six, six, if they are out of removal, that will lock them off from attacking us, but they can keep chipping at us with the Altasaur's tap ability. Because of that, I think I do get the chump in here. Rather than going to 8 after sacking the tote. That'd be a 4 turn clock from the Altasaur. Yikes. So they're primarily just green-red dinos over there. Got a 4, 5, and 6 drop a dinosaur. Maybe hurl into... Um, Discovery or whatever it's called. The counter spell that discovers a bunch might be okay in this matchup. Certainly our bounce spells are pretty great against these large creatures. Just bouncing an Altasaur at a pivotal time is going to find us some potential victories. Waterwind Scout. I do like having another flyer. Still think I just flipped the iceberg for the turn, though. And if I play another flyer, I also crack the map token onto the scout, then I have two different, potentially three power flyers. Got no legal blocks for the cavern stomper, though, without flipping the iceberg. I mean, I guess I can chump block with a siren or a scout. But if they use the ability, that's jamming in for a lot. I think they did scry one to the top here. Not certain on that. I wish Arena had a little log that would tell me, because it's so easy to miss that. Seeing where they scryed the card when you're trying to keep track of some other stuff in the background. The 7-7 seven, seven versus their 7-7. Seven, seven. Down to 11. Well, that 
that's a combat trick. At 11 life, your basically any combat trick in this set is at least plus 2 plus 0. That's the Ancestor's Aid. So if I don't block, I die to a combat trick because they'll deal 9 minimum and then tap the Altasaur to kill me. But if I block with the Iceberg Titan, it's going to die to their combat trick regardless of what it is. Staggering size, Ancestor's Aid, anything like that. So it's a rock and a hard place here. And none of my multi-blocks even play around any of the combat tricks, right? I block with Titan and two other creatures. My board still just completely dies to Staggering Size or Ancestor's Aid. So I think I have to just single block with the Iceberg Titan. The reason I'm not just chumping with the Gnome is because I die to Staggering Size. If I do that. Alright, get the trade. Dealt with the spookiest threats. There's a Hoverstone Pilgrim. I can blow that up with my Deconstruction Hammer and my Spring-Loaded Saw Blades, which is nice. Gonna cost me some extra mana to do so. So, five mana total to blow it up. A sixth to equip this to the Gnome and then blow it up. So that takes my entire turn if I do that. If I just play the Waterwind Scout, Then I can also use the map token and Sawblades the Altasaur in the same turn. I think that's pretty good. So they're going to crack one of their caves next turn for value. Land for us. I guess I put this on something that I am threatening to activate immediately. Obviously, I don't activate it when they have the ward, but now I can pretend I could activate it if they play another artifact or enchantment. But I guess since I'm tapping out for saw blades right now anyway, it doesn't really matter. All right, saw blades was a beautiful draw. We'll see what they draw here. They get a draw step and a discover. But if they don't find Reach, or a Flying Creature, or a Blocker, then we can move our Decommission Hammer to our Gnome, kill the Pilgrim, and then kill them by hitting for exactly four in the sky. If they attack with the Axe Draw, I think I have to take it so that I have a creature to put the Decommission Hammer onto and tap to try to kill them. Which does put me dead to double combat trick if they can plus four the Axe Draw. This I don't love, because now there's a Waterwind Scout at risk of the combat trick. But I think we are putting a Waterwind Scout in front of the Paleontologist. They have a staggering size here. They trample over for two. Still puts me alive at two life. Obviously, ideally hoping that does not happen here. But if I don't block, we're just dead to the staggering size. And if I block with a gnome and they don't have a combat trick, then I no longer have a way to put a hammer on and blow up the pilgrim and kill them on the crackback. And that can be what they're hoping for here. Since these creatures don't help them on blocks at all anyway. They could just be trying to clear out my gnome. Okay, down to four. Alright, discover. This is going to determine the outcome of the game. <laughs> it's a reach blocker. Oh, there's a waylaying pirates. Oh my god. Exactly enough mana? <laughs> that went from... Real sketchy to just incredible top deck real quick there. Oh wait, no, I need to pay Ward. Shoot. I guess, no I don't. If I just attack all here, if they don't have a one blue mana, like a Cogwork Wrestler, we win still. Alright. Okay. 
well, find a victory in game one. I think this is a pretty reasonable matchup up front. I do like our bounce spells a lot, our unlucky drop. Our brackish blunder, I think, are just great in this matchup. Hurl could be okay. It's still really narrow. We need to be in a position where we can afford to hold up the five mana and then try to get them to cast a six drop. Which I don't think was happening super often that game. I mean, because we were a little flooded, we were holding up five here and there, because we kept like a five lander at the start, but ah, even this matchup, I just don't see this happening super, super consistently. I think we have enough good cards against Dinos, like tapping and stunning them, bouncing them away, um, turning them into one ones. I think we're already sort of pre sideboarded against a deck that has a lot of big creatures. I don't think Hurl really helps us that much. And that's the only card that looks decent here, out of the sideboard. Everything else, I just prefer our main deck cards right now. I mean, we'll take another peek. Did I have any removal that's like only good against tiny things or something? I really don't think so. No, I think the deck looks really solid. Maybe the Shipwreck Sentry is not super great. Since their ground troops are going to be so big anyway. But I mean, what am I playing over that? I dropped the Shipwreck Sentry to try the... The Hurl into history, maybe a Didact Echo just for another late game flyer. Gotta have four permanents engraved for that though, and I don't actually think I ended up with too many permanents engraved last game, although I was not paying attention to be fair. Yeah, no, I'm just gonna run it back here. Here we are now for game number two. No white source in the opener, but the Puzzle Door or the Iceberg could draw it, plus we've got Waterwind Scout to use a map token towards it. No creatures till turn three, but I don't think that's a death sentence in this matchup. Find a Petrify, which is a very solid draw. Seems pretty good against big dinos. Alright, two mana, two, three, haste it is. Aggro us out while we're on a slower hand. Seems like a reasonable plan for our opponent. Don't have the white source to just petrify this thing even if I wanted to right now. And just Iceberg here. It's probably a tiny bit better than just cracking the puzzle door because any land gets us to Waterwind Scout anyway. Oh. If we mill the planes, then I guess it's not better than the puzzle door. But we hit another one, so we're good. So now I can petrify that firstborn. Being on the defensive here, them rolling out, but then we don't have a petrify for their much bigger dinos later. Could Tinker's Tote get some chumps going? Or we can start the Flying Assault with a Waterwind Scout? They have three mana up and they chose not to play anything this turn, so... If they have a three mana spell in hand, it might be like a Watley's Final Strike to blow up a creature, in which case if we play a Buelo, then we just soak up all their mana, they do nothing this turn because of our ward, but if we play Waterwind Scout, it gives them a great reason to just Final Strike before we pass, and they get to stay mana efficient throughout this game. I think that's reasonable, and then that lets us play and activate the map the same turn next turn. Yeah, they might have something here they're thinking. Yeah, so we soak up all the mana here, even if they have the Watley's Final Strike in hand. They need to wait till they have five to kill the Abuela with that card. Four drop could be their pathfinding axe draw now. Bedrock tortoise. All of their creatures deal damage equal to toughness, so the firstborn's now a 3 3. That's pretty rough, because even if I petrify that, firstborn's jamming in for extra damage at this point. I mean, we're going to have to petrify that. It's a 6 6. 
So I can play two two mana spells here. I can't play Petrify and the Aspirant actually because I don't have enough white mana, but I could play Petrify and the Guidewing by filtering a mana through the Captivating Cave. That's a perfectly fine turn. And that is the play. And then I might just chump with the Guidewing. Get a counter on Abuelo. Now they do have the 5 mana for the final strike, though. If we can draw a ton of mana, we can start flickering a Tinker's Tote every turn in the future. For a ton of little 1-1 blockers, so... Let me see. Alright, there's the Hoverstone Pilgrim. There's the Spring-Loaded Sawblades. Clear out the Firstborn with that. Could also clear out the Pilgrim if I had another land. I guess either of these are pretty threatening attackers now. The Pilgrim potentially a 5-5 flyer, so we need to clear that out with the Sawblades. So I can Puzzle Door if there's a land in the top two, then I can Puzzle Door and Sawblades. If there's not, then I can't, but I think I kind of need to. I need to start getting ahead with some great card advantage here by doing something like getting a Sawblades down and starting to flicker it from then on. Otherwise, I'm just falling behind if I'm only playing Sawblades next turn. I mean, it's a little greedy, but I think I need to find a big swing in my favor here by like hitting a land. And this is going to be a huge swing in my favor if we can get this to work out for us. Of course, that does also involve Abuelo not dying for the Sawblades Flicker to go. But even if Abuelo dies here, having the extra mana at the ready for next turn is still really helpful. Ooh, the sideboarded over the edge to clear out the Petrify. It's pretty gross. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, their whole board has Hexproof during their turn anyway. So I can't even Sawblades till my turn. Shoot. Well, that was incorrect. Having the mana up does give me a free chump here at least, but... Yeah, them hitting the over the edge means I don't think it mattered too much what I did here now. Taking seven. Eight. Good lord. Alright, so the play was then... Probably just Tinker's Tote after the puzzle. Just to chump two things, which is just not a very winning position. Still. Yeah, we're going to have a really bad time that turn no matter what. Yeah, this tortoise is disgusting. Absolutely filthy card. Glossodactyl as well. Alright, well, our 5-mana Counterspell would have been terrible this game. I'm pretty glad I didn't side that in. But we're also super dead. Don't think there was a lot we could have done. Obviously, last turn could have been much better. If I didn't forget about the, uh, the Hexproof ability on the Tortoise. We'd still be down to like 6 or something here. With no trades anywhere. Yeah, I just, I can't even hold up the saw blades against this stupid tortoise thing. So I can tap out and saw blades the pilgrim, go chump chump and die? Mm. Trampler, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna save my brain energy for next game, this one is not winnable from here. Alright. Don't think Echo looked very good that game. That was just a quick aggro curve with a great bomb on turn four. I don't think any of the sideboard looks good here. I think we're running it back and just hoping that we can get that on the play advantage. Out tempo our opponent in the final game of the round. Obviously, Petrify just got a little bit weaker now that they have main deck artifact enchantment removal, but even without the Petrify, they have plenty of good targets. Blowing up an iceberg or a guide mural or something like the card is just going to be good against us. Period. There's no amount of sideboarding we can do to try to blank their natural eyes.
a 3-3 on the ground actually would have looked pretty good that game against that Firstborn. River Herald Scout would have looked fine if it explored into an on-land card. It would have been a 2-3 blocking the Firstborn until they dropped the bomb rare. Yeah, I don't think anything looked that bad. I think we're going right back in there for the final game of round one. All right. Two lander with a puzzle door to dig into the third to play Abuelo. Shipwreck sentry turn two if we need a blocker. Or if we need to just beat down with it. I guess I can play it turn two and turn three, play and equip a hammer, or play and crack the puzzle door for our next land. Yeah, let's get the hammer man out of the way. And the next turn, sentry, and then puzzle door and crack it after that. Ooh, unless we hit a Buelo. And then we cast a Buelo instead, which means we don't attack this turn, but I think that's fine. Love having the Blunder here. I think Blunder's great in this matchup. It's the Paleontologist. They can drop a 4-mana spell immediately next turn. I don't like that very much, but I can Blunder whatever they cast at least, which is cute. Maybe... I guess there is a little argument for just jamming in for four with the sentry. I can't be perfectly mana efficient doing that, but I can play the puzzle door and crack it and equip the hammer. I guess that is mana efficient. There's no flyer out yet, but deals four for the turn. I genuinely don't hate that. Find an Iceberg or a Petrify. Iceberg means we attack with Sentry again, but so does Blunder on a tapped creature. Four out of the six mana for Iceberg already, and it draws us another card. I think I'm actually taking the Iceberg. Weirdly enough... All right, they're down to 16. Now they have four mana available, thanks to the Paleontologist. And there's the stupid tortoise. Spyglass Siren is a beautiful draw. Beautiful draw. Guess so I can get a flyer on the board and attack with Sentry in the same turn, but I'm probably just going to blunder the tortoise, play the Iceberg, and attack with the Sentry this turn. Yeah, I think that's pretty fine, too. Militote, draw Wailing Pirates to stun the Tortoise next turn? Don't mind if I do. We're just gonna keep beating down with a Sentry. I mean, I have to hit a land, but then I could play Siren and Pirates next turn so I can get an attack in with the Sentry and stun the Tortoise. We've gotten eight damage out of this dork now. If we do resolve an Abuelo, that's going to be one of the cards flicker back. They flicker in the end steps. So that doesn't actually work that well with the sentry because we'll get the artifacts to hit the battlefield after the combat phase. It's good with the iceberg, though, for just spamming some card draw or the pirates. We're getting some extra stuns and some end steps. Alright, Hoverstone Pilgrim's a little annoying here. I could just blow it up. Because I don't have enough power to attack past the Pilgrim. I have to tap out to blow it up this turn. My alternate play is Spyglass Siren, trying to get a counter onto the Sentry if I'm lucky. How much do I like spinning that roulette wheel? Because, I mean, it lets me play Abuelo and Siren this turn, which is a pretty good use of mana, too. Yeah. Let's get on that slot machine, as this format uh, tempts you to do. Find the Eaten by Piranhas? Oh my god, what a draw. Put them to 7 here, or they chump block. I 
don't have an artifact to play next turn now, so we won't be attacking with sentry next turn, but we can attack with some flyers. Eating the pilgrim with piranhas, or destroying the pilgrim with the deconstruction hammer and just getting rid of our plus one plus one. Probably eat the pilgrim with flyers and move the hammer to a flyer to hit for four, put them to three life. And then we um, don't need to pay ward for pirates to stun anything on blocks, because their one big ward flyer will be a 1-1 one -one instead. Alright, there's the bedrock tortoise. Send in with the Hoverstone Pilgrim, since we know we can just eat it with piranhas anyway. And I have to do it sorcery speed because of the tortoise. With the waylaying pirates coming up for if I hit a sixth land, if they attack with the pilgrim, is it worth it to... Ooh, tectonic hazard to kill our 1-1 flyer. I'm not the greatest, but not bad. Alright, now that they don't attack with Pilgrim, that makes the turn much simpler. We just make it a 1 1 buff Abuelo and hit them to 4 life. Can't attack with the Sentry anyway, even if I do shut off the Tortoise. And they probably. S they might spend the turn on their naturalized thing, blow up our Eaten by Peronas. And I just blow up the Pilgrim the turn after that. Or stun it with Waylaying Pirates if we hit a land, so I think that works fine. Yeah, I mean, if they naturalize our Eaten by Piranhas and we top deck a land, we can still hit for three here. Alternatively, if we top deck a land and they naturalize our Eaten by Piranhas, we can move the decommission hammer to the sentry and have the sentry kill the pilgrim, paying the ward mana to still attack for two with a Boilo. But if we hit the land, it's just going to be Wailing Pirates, definitely. Mineshaft Spider for another Reach creature. I don't even need ward to tap that one down to put them down to one life here. Really happy with this Waylaying Pirates in hand. Jamming for 6 with the Tortoise, and they got it. We're down to 13. We do hit the land for the ward. Um, but they don't have a ward creature anyway. So, I mean, I guess the land makes us uh, lets us flip the Iceberg alternatively. But just stunning their Reach Blocker is definitely better. Putting them to 1 life. I guess if we flip the Iceberg, we attack with a 4-4 four four this turn, which is reasonable. And then we've got a 6-6 six six to try to beat down with in the future. I think I would rather go for a stun here, though. Put them to one life. I probably should have moved my hammer over, but I could have this issue where I move it over and then I want to move it back and I don't have a seventh mana to flip the iceberg and move the hammer back, so I think it's the worst play in the world to not move the hammer here. Discover four, just dig for an out here, find an axe draw which will not save them, and we start the arena open day two, one and O oh, with a victory in the first round. That is going to up our prizes from 500 gems all the way up to 1500 gems, which is great. Not only that, but it brings us a step closer to potentially making it in to draft number two. This is not an excellent keep here, but with opponent on a mulligan to six at least, I think it's fine. The thing that's really rough about it, of course, is because it's a captivating cave instead of an island, we're going to have to play off curve if we don't naturally find a blue source, playing our first spell on turn three instead of turn two. And if we don't explore into one or draw one, it's going to get really bad from there. But with two different ways to dig, I think it's perfectly reasonable against anything except a really aggressive deck. But the format is capable of some really aggressive decks. We do immediately find the blue source, which is lovely. 
We're playing against a green deck, another green-red Dinos deck it looks like, with the Burning Sun Cavalry turn 2, which plays like a 2-mana 3-3, three, three, as long as they have a dinosaur on their board. Which is kind of rough, because that means even if I explore into a non-land, the scout as a 2-3 won't be able to block this if they play the 3-mana three 3-3 three, three Dino. I think I still play to the board, though, and play something that can actually declare attacks and blocks, rather than the Iceberg right now. And we didn't hit the non-land card anyway, so... Whether or not they play a dino, the scout is not going to be able to block. They did not play a dino, but they played a Poetic Ingenuity, which is really scary when you cast it early. Super bad top deck late in the game, but at this point of the game, it's a great spell, making it so every artifact spell they cast comes with a 3-1. So this is really hard to beat when dropped early in a deck that has a decent artifact count. So I'm pretty scared about that. The fact that they're green-red means they probably don't have an insane... Artifact count, at least. But, I mean, turning cards like Inverted Iceberg into Inverted Iceberg and a 3-1 is so gross. Alright, no Artifact spell this turn, and no Dino to get the treasure tokens off this thing, either. Take the two, we're down to 16. Fourth mana, we can start just stunning things with Waylaying Pirates over and over. But I kind of like double iceberg here and saving the pirates for once they resolve a big like 6-6 six, six dino that it looks like they're trying to ramp into off of this poison dart frog. With the two mana up, they can death touch the frog and trade it into the scout. So there's that, but then they don't have the mana dork anymore. And since it has death touch off that activated ability, it's going to kill one of our solid creatures at some point no matter what we do. So I'm pretty cool with jamming in here and accepting a trade with the Death Toucher if they want to. They'll take the three damage, and let's get some Icebergs down for some card draw. And then just start stunning everything they play after that. Ooh, an Oaken Siren? Well, never mind. We will play to the board a little bit and cast an Oaken Siren instead of a second Iceberg. Did we mill an artifact? Nope, just the planes. So we can't flip this Iceberg without exiling something off board, at least. Ceratops is a big, scary dino, a 5-4 that's almost impossible to block, so we have found our stun target. So we're going to stun that and use a map on the Oaken Siren. Unfortunately, finding a land, so no plus one, plus one counters. But I think our board still looks really good when we stun the Ceratops. Still look pretty ahead here. Now with a 3-3 to trade into their 3-3 as well. Plundering Pirate, 3-2 and a treasure token. Doesn't trigger Poetic Ingenuity, so we're cool with that. This Poetic Ingenuity is looking like our best friend this game. Three mana to do absolutely nothing. Seems like a good card for us to see our opponent have. Iron Paw Aspirant to speed up the clock in the sky here. Although without... Stunning that Poison Dart Frog, they will find a trade into one of our flyers. I think I'm just stunning the Ceratops again to keep them off of us, and we just send in with these two. They probably trade Waterwind Scout off, which lets us keep the Siren, because that one has Vigilance and taps for mana. So I'm actually going to post-combat this Aspirant, because if I pre-combat it and make it the Oaken Siren a 2-3 Flying Vigilance, they're going to kill that with a Death Touch, and I'd much rather they kill the 2-2 Waterwind Scout. So, we're going to do post-combat nonsense here. Let them trade the Dart Frog off. Yep, that is the trade we want, because the Oaken Siren's going to be much better for having Vigilance and being a Mana Dork for our double Iceberg. So now we Aspirant. Onto the Oaken Siren. And we Wailing Pirates down the Ceratops. Start flipping 6-6s six or sacking our Captivating Cave to buff our Oaken Siren even more. Uh-oh, they might have drawn removal for the Oaken Siren here. They keep eyeballing it. Maybe in a braid here, because they're looking at the iceberg as well, trying to find out what they might want to blow up. Don't have an artifact engraved yet, but if they abrade the Oaken Siren, I will, and we'll be able to flip an iceberg. 
Deconstruction Hammer is the draw, which is not a bad one at all. 3-2 Plundering Pirate on board. I think we send in the 3-3 three, three, and the 2-3. We are going to take a hit from the Ceratops, but we can take one. Six mana to flip an Iceberg. If I play and equip a Deconstruction Hammer, if they don't blow up Oaken Siren, then I can still flip the Iceberg, but if they do, then I can't. So against our opponent tapping for nothing here, I imagine they probably have removal for Oaken Siren, so it is safer to not try to play and equip the hammer here so that I do have the mana up for the Iceberg. Guaranteed. But we'll see. Maybe they don't kill the Siren. Alright, looks like they don't kill the Siren, but that lets me play this other Iceberg and flip this one instead. Which I think is also good. Because I do still have to exile an artifact from my board, so... Maybe, um... Exiling this Iceberg is reasonable for the other Iceberg. Because I'm definitely not exiling the Oaken Siren. Five, six, yeah. Let's exile an Iceberg to flip an Iceberg. If they have a ton of combat tricks, we might just die here. Just send in the Ceratops and make it 13 power. Again, I think our matchup against green-red dinos is super solid. Not sure what we've got in the sideboard for this, because a lot of our main deck stuff's already great. Our bounce spells. I do have the rock slide to clear out the titan, which means Ceratops does get an attack in. Gives them a treasure token. And they've got the Dreadmaw's Ire, which blows up our Oaken Siren, which is horrible for us. Oh my god. I mean, we're not insta-dead unless they top deck um, another trick, and we just top decked Petrify, which is awesome. So we Petrify the Ceratops here, and we try to speed kill them before they draw into anything, so we're buffing some Ground Dork for extra damage. And they're dead on board if they top deck a land, because we can buff up with this hammer. They hit a Burning Sun Cavalry, which is not a land. We hit a land, though. Put the hammer on the Aspirant, and then if they don't chump block, they go to 1. If I put the hammer on the Scout, they can block with this as a 3-3 three, three and kill the Scout. Take 3, go to 2, which is pretty bad. So I think I just hammer the Aspirant and send it. And then move the hammer back. Go to 1 is the choice. Hammer back to the Scout so we don't die to the plus 3, plus 3 trample trick. The problem with that is I'd have to... Okay, I was going to say the problem with that is... In order to not die to the plus three plus three trample trick, I would have to block that if they declare an attack, which would then be worse for me if they just follow up by playing another creature. So they'd have a really good bluff there if they just draw another creature of just sending in the cavalry and I'm almost forced to block to play around a potential trick. Luckily, they don't bluff at all. They're just going to scoop them up. I'm guessing probably just a land draw. So 1-0 to start off this round. I think it's a favorable matchup. This Poetic Ingenuity is really, really bad in their deck. If you're playing this just for treasure tokens, it's just not worth it. And we saw zero artifact spells yet, so hopefully they keep that in, because that was super helpful. They basically mulliganed again by having that in their hand. Um, yeah, I don't think anything's insane here. Relic's Road might actually be okay. <laughs> Weirdly, but probably not insane. Can I stop highlighting cards? No. I can't unhighlight cards, so the board is just covered now. Doesn't matter where I click, it won't unhighlight the ingenuity. Okay, there we go. Now I can look through the grave. Um, so we saw one instant. We saw Dreadmaw's Ire, which is really bad for us. The card is really good against artifact heavy decks. This is going to be a nasty combat trick to keep in track, or to keep in mind, because even if we play around it, like... It's going to be miserable. Plus two, plus two trample, and destroy one of our cards. It's going to be super, super hard to, to play around. 
All right. Rumbling Rock Slide's one of their removal spells. That's fine. Our deck's pretty good against Rock Slide because they end up using this on a one to three mana flyer, which means we get a mana advantage there. And they're probably using it on something that also gave us a map token. So also a little bit of card advantage uh, from them using one for one removal on one of those flyers like that. Yeah, I'm pretty reasonably happy with the matchup. I don't think I'm changing anything here, really. I think we're going to run it back for game number two of round two. All right, our opponent is on the play here. We've got Guidewing into Waterwind Scout into Unlucky Drop Later. A very reasonable start, but our opponent has an explosive start. Only one one mana mana dork in the format, and they've got it. The Ixali's Lure Keeper on the play, meaning that they can cast three mana dinosaurs while we still have one land on board, four mana dinosaurs when I still have two lands on board. They can get very, very far ahead by being on the play, plus having a mana dork, which is not good for me. If they have any cheap removal, they probably want to kill this guide wing before I have another creature to explore onto. I don't think I can trade Guidewing off into a combat trick, and if they're attacking with Lore Keeper without a combat trick, it probably means they don't have any dinos in hand to ramp into anyway, which means the trade is still bad, even if they don't have a combat trick. They would not make that attack if they didn't have a reasonable trade. Hoken Siren's a beautiful draw, now we are curving out, which is going to help against the opponent who's curving out, potentially even curving out above us, like skipping over to four mana cards next turn. We'll see. If they've got their Dreadmaw's Ire in their hand, this turn's gonna be terrible for us. Just hit for a ton of damage and kill our Oaken Siren. They do have the Scythe Claw Raptor, so a three mana dino they get to cast even off of just two mana. But they're stuck on just two lands there. So they're almost definitely on some kind of combat trick, declaring the attack with that lore keeper with the raptor in hand and with only two lands in their hand. So we definitely have them on a combat trick of some sort. Could play a Tinker's Tote to chump the raptor for a turn. I think that's fine, but I'm just going to jam out some flyers here and try to get racing while they're stuck on mana. Petrify is a beautiful draw. I can play Petrify and the Tinker's Toad if they don't kill my Oaken Siren. But they might kill my Oaken Siren with Dreadmaw's Ire or Rumbling Rock Slide. I guess they don't have the mana for the Rock Slide. Okay. I mean, they're racing well here. We're going down 7 life. Down to 9. There's a Plundering Pirate for another creature plus a treasure token to jam out some more stuff. But now we play a ton of Trump Blockers and shut off their biggest attacker. We're going for it, and then we get to gain life off of the Tinker's Tote next turn as well. Which is super helpful. We need to make sure to Unlucky drop during our turn, because even if the Raptor is petrified... It still shoots me in the face for four if I cast something during their turn. So we need to sorcery speed our unlucky drop on their next big dino. But hopefully the Tinker's Tote is just enough blocks on the ground to get us there. We're killing them in three attacks in the sky. So we need to survive three more attacks from our opponent. She had two chump blockers, a gain three, and an unlucky drop might be able to do that. So they have four cycle of bristle back, get their fourth land, so they have five mana up this turn. For casting dinos only, lore keepers only dinosaur mana. Jam in with the squad, and here is where they are going to use that combat trick to kill us if they have it. If it was a Dreadmaw's Ire, I imagine they would have just popped it earlier to kill our Oaken Siren, so it's probably like the plus three, plus three trample thing. They're hitting for seven on board. If it's plus three, plus three trample, and I block with a single 1-1, one, one, we're dead to plus three, plus three trample. 
because we take exactly nine. So I think I actually have to double chump here. And maybe a guide wing chump is reasonable. Because if we have a non-land on top, we keep just as much power in the sky. Mm. I guess I could do like this, and they can only combat trick one of these, and we can still get the plus one plus one counter, then we go drop and gain life. Oh. Was not expecting that at all. I probably should have tried to buff the Waterwind Scout since it's not an artifact, so it's a little less fragile. Okay, there's the Colossodactyl. We know what we're doing to that. Make them redraw it next turn, but even next turn, it's going to be the blocker for our board. we got to draw some non-lands here. We have explored into some maps, or into some maps, into some lands. Well, we're out of gas here. And we can't get through that Colossodactyl. Some Waylaying Pirates would be beautiful. I mean, even just one Waylaying Pirates might win us the game. Oh, not like this. Yeah, I can't attack into a 4 5 reach. All right. Yep. There's still a draw in action here. And now I'm forced to chump. Might as well chump 3 damage instead of 2 damage. Well, was not in the cards for us this game. But I think we played that out super fine. Just ran out of action, flooded in the end. Which definitely happens. We are one and one now, which means we get to be on the play for game three. Again, pretty happy with this deck. I think the drop is fine. The petrify is great. Pirates are great. Honestly, everything in the deck I'm looking at, pretty happy with. Yet again. Send in the squad, hope for some moderately better draws to wrap this round off. But we've got our fingers crossed here, heading into game three of round two. Turn one Spyglass Siren. We have a Petrify and a Wailing Pirates if we hit another artifact. Keep it here. Can definitely flood out if we are unlucky, but that's a risk of almost any hand. But starting on four lands does mean any additional land draws can be pretty awkward. And obviously if we don't find another artifact for the Waylaying Pirates, that's going to be pretty bad. But we have found another artifact, Waterwind Scout's map token, which we won't have the time to sacrifice. In between playing the Scout and the Pirates, which is kind of perfect, I'll keep the Aspirant here with the Flyers to put counters onto. We won't be playing the Aspirant till turn 4, but if we don't have a good card to stun for the Waylaying Pirates, then turn 4 Aspirant is fine. Because we'll have the map token to spend a mana on, so we just use the map token and the Iron Paw Aspirant turn 4. I think it's a pretty reasonable play. The only flaw with it is it leaves us with zero artifacts on board again for when we potentially play the Waylaying Pirates. Our opponent starts off with double red. We're going to see their first abrade here. They do have an abrade in their deck, we just haven't seen it till now. Very nice, solid, efficient removal. Stuck on the double red here, and we do hit a Sunscribe, but I can't double spell because I don't have double white. So let's just buff the Scout. And the Sunscribe is another artifact to have on board when we play the Waylane Pirates. I have a double red spell that can kill a four toughness card? No. I was going to say that would be very surprising. I can't even think of one in this format. 
And there's the concession from our opponents. Some rough draws for them in the final game means we are going to get a victory in round two. Now 2-0 two and o to start off our Arena Open Day 2 draft, which means we're only one round win away from draft number two, and we're guaranteed at least 2,500 gems back out of this event. So fingers crossed here, we've got two rounds, two chances to get into day two draft number two, and that is all I really want. Being able to get into that second draft is always a lot of fun, so we'll see how it all pans out for us as we head into the incredibly important round number three. Here we are for round three. Our opponent is on the play. So we're on the draw here, but this hand is excellent. Playing against a fellow white deck. We'll start with the guide wing turn one, probably the oak and siren turn two, so that on turn three I can play aspirant and iceberg if they don't have interaction. So jam in for one, get another flying vigilant threat down and pass from there. Send in the Enterprising Scallywag, which there's no universe in which we can block. They might have Dreadmaw's Ire immediately, that would be brutal. If they do, they are not going to cast it. They're going to go for a Tinker's Tote for a couple 1-1s one on the ground, which doesn't really change things at all for us. I'm pretty happy with that. This also means they're tapped out. So I know I can just Aspirant Iceberg here freely. So I can just Aspirant pre-combat, know that I get to keep the counter, jam in for this damage, drop the Iceberg, draw the card. Mill a land, draw a River Herald Scout. All right, that is the sequence we would want out of those two cards. Draw on the non-land and mill the land. Although we do need a second blue source if our Oaken Siren dies to flip our Iceberg. Send in that 2-2 two -two again, no blocks. If you've got the Dreadmaw's Ire, it's a one for one. I'm not going to let you kill my Guidewing, Aspirant, and Siren off of one card. Yeah. Not going to fool me with that one, opponent. So they do get to blow up the Oaken Siren, which is just why that card is so excellent. It's like if you trick your opponent and they go for the block, they would have killed all of our board with one spell. And even if I don't block, it's like you can't even play around it that well, because then they just still kill my Oaken Siren. Which is still pretty bad for me. And now a Sunshot Militia with this wide of a board state. It's going to get a lot of free damage in. We do not like that at all. So. I'm two mana away from flipping an Iceberg. Because it's only turn four, believe it or not. With how this game has gone. So if I just play Waylaying Pirates for the turn, I'm stunning like a 2-2. I mean, then they don't get any attacks in on the ground, but I'm also only chipping in for one. If I play River Herald Scout, all I'm doing is setting up my draw, though, so neither of these is particularly good. I guess I just play the Pirates and Scout next turn, and then flip Iceberg the turn after that. I guess it is what it is, which is not great. I mean, it's just fine. Do I do this? Or do I keep a 1-2 to block these 1-1s? One I feel like Pirates already stops their attacks if they don't have a trick. Plus, Guidewing is vigilant, so I guess that threatens to block as well, but that's probably not blocking. Kaparakti Sunborn, the Mythic Uncommon. Whenever it attacks, they get to tap two of their untapped cards to discover four, so we gotta find removal for that instantly, and we did not, but we did hit a four drop, which is one of our better draws here. Just get a 4-4 four, four on the board to block it. Now I wish I just played Scout last turn so I could Pirates the Sunborn, stop them from discovering. This is a really close game. If we do lose this, then this is a close enough game that just flipping the board state between who's on the play and who's on the draw could have changed the outcome here. Maybe on the play. 
I feel like that is literally the differential. Like, if we were on the play and they were on the draw, it's probably us 13, them 10, us slightly ahead, them slightly behind, instead of the opposite, which is what it's ended up being here. Sunborn gets to try to absolutely pop off from this point on, though. If they don't have two combat tricks, I can just double block Sunborn with a 4-4 four, four, and a 3-3, three, three, and that'll make sure the Sunborn dies. Because they could have Ancestor's Aid for plus 2, plus 0 oh, first strike, but then they'd only first strike away one of our creatures, and we'd kill the Sunborn with the other. They could have Cosmium Blast, I guess, to deal 4 to one of our cards. That would just be a full-on removal spell, though, at which point they might have just used that on a Guidewing earlier. I don't know, against basically anything else, blocking with 4-4 and 3-3 on Sunborn is good. Although there's the Reliquary to clear out the 4-4. So now if they have any combat tricks, Sunborn gets to stick around, no matter how we block, because they just first strike away the Waylaying Pirates, or they have three additional toughness, or they just discover an Aspirant to force the triple block. They kill Aspirant Guidewing here, or they have a combat trick and we insta-lose. I mean, I guess they can kill Pirates and Aspirants to lower our board state. We are taking a lot of damage from Militia here. So just clearing out our bigger blockers could be reasonable. Oh yeah, they can do that too. Discover a land, not super helpful. We've already got our land for turn for next turn. And they have more action here, just another threat. Instead of a land in hand for our opponent. And another land for us. Well, I can play one 6-6 six, six blocker, block two things. Block, block, take one, two, three, four. Get shot for a fifth off of these two. Not technically that on board, but... They can just use the Militia and not attack with anybody, and we've got no route to victory from this point. I suppose we might as well play it out, get a little more information on their deck at least. But it just looks like a pretty streamlined red-white deck where this round might literally be whoever's on the play wins every single game. And if that is the case, they win game one, we win game two, and they win game three, and we lose the round. So hopefully that's not the case. Yep, another creature for Militia. They don't even have to attack in here. Leave a single blocker up just in case. There's eaten by piranhas for the militia, but it is too late now. We're getting attacked by enough creatures to kill us even without militia's ability. Suppose I can have three blockers on the board, which means block there, block there, block there, take one, two, three, four. Yeah, that's super dead. I think I just concede here then rather than give them more info. I mean, if they chump the titan, block, block, block. I'm still dead on board. I guess I could play two blockers instead of playing Eaten by Piranhas on the Militia, but then they just tap everything and I die, so it doesn't matter that I can flip this and get two blockers off of the Titan Guide Mural combo. Because sure, then I have four blockers, but I die without them even declaring an attack. So yeah, the only play is to hope they chump, and even if they do, we don't have enough blockers with Scout plus Eaten. And if they don't, we definitely don't. 0-1 to start it off. But a close enough game, I think. A little bit comes down to who's on the play in this matchup. Do we have anything great against quicker decks? Not really. Once again, I think our, our deck is kind of just the best combination of our cards that we've drafted already in most matchups. Like, it definitely was against those red-green dino decks, and still here, like... Don't love the Eaten by Piranhas against these more aggressive decks, but shutting off Sunshot Militia's ability is still decent. 
Unlucky Drop is kind of a lot of mana, but they do have some cards we do really need to shut off with the Kaparakti Sunborn. So being able to have that against cards like that is nice. Okay, come on, Arena, show me my sideboard. Thank you. Um, yeah, love the Saw Blades in this matchup. Love the Tinker's Tote. Send it all back in, heading into game two of round number three. Here we are with an okay opening hand. Nothing till turn three, and having a five drop here is a little rough. Three, four, five being the curve is definitely slower than we would want in this matchup, but I don't think I can afford to risk a mulligan on something like this because it's still a reasonable hand on the play. On the draw, it might be slow enough to force a mulligan in this aggressive matchup, but on the play, I think it's about as good as our average six card hand is going to be by giving us the extra card advantage of having a 7th card in the hand. Turn 1 Deconstruction Hammer, that card is very good against us. Also very good in our deck. So we have our own copy of it. But this can like blow up our Guide Mural if we ever try to flip it. Can blow up a lot of our, a few of our creatures, our Oak and Sirens and stuff. And until then it's just a great little buff for aggro decks. So there's a turn two compass gnome. Mana fix them if they need it. They don't. Oh, they do. They grab a hidden volcano for Tapland next turn. I heard the shuffle. I didn't see the the card reveal or anything. So I was like, oh, they don't use it here. But no, they did. They did grab a hidden volcano. So late in the game, they can crack that to discover. Just put the hammer on the gnome and get in here. On the play, I think I just take that and then I stun the gnome. Or stun the guide wing, trade into the gnome. Abuelo. Abuelo guide mural is pretty sick. So now we're hoping to hit six mana to play, play Abuelo and activate Abuelo in the same turn. So we go, our curve is going to be... Pirate Guide Mural Abuelo, hoping that we have a second white source for Abuelo turn 6. Yeah, that is certainly the play. I guess I don't hate them chomping with Guidewing and exploring onto the Compass Gnome here, but they aren't going to do that, so let's stun the Guidewing, otherwise they make it a 2-2 Flying Vigilance, and it gets in and threatens to block the Scout. Seventeen life, about to play a four-four. Maybe I actually don't trade, especially because if they have that Dreadmaw's Ire, it's pretty gross. I guess I only have a map token right now, so Dreadmaw's Ire isn't disgusting till next turn. But we are fingers crossed they never draw that card. That is a massive swing in their favor if they ever hit it. All right, there's the second white source. I mean, so we basically we're going to win this game if they don't have Dreadmaw's Ire, and we're going to lose if they do have Dreadmaw's Ire. Seven power on their board. But if I try to just block with pirates, they Ire over it and kill my guide mural at the same time. And I guess having a 4-4 and a 3-3 on blocks means they can only ire one of those combats, which is something. And if they don't have the ire, we just start winning from next turn, just abuelowing this guide mural over and over. I mean, I guess they could decommission the guide mural, but we're two mana away from actually... Um, flipping it. So I doubt they just hold other mana up to shoot the guide mural this turn. They're probably planning to kill it next turn. This doesn't look like Dreadmaw's Ire. I feel like Dreadmaw's Ire would be some attacks on the ground, so that's a good sign. 
yeah, tap out for Tinker's Totes. They don't have the decommission mana up. Exile another artifact you control, return it to the battlefield under its own control at the beginning of the next end step. So we have to play this and use it immediately, otherwise next turn when I try to flicker the guide mural, they decommission it in response and the flicker doesn't pop off. Guide wing's their only flyer, I don't hate the trade. But we can probably get them to just cash in the guide wing anyway. We're going to have another flyer and two 4-4s four -fours on the ground after this attack, after this combat. I think I can send in both of my ground troops. I guess there's an argument for sending in the scout and just dropping the decommission hammer if they block with guide wing. I feel like that's a significantly worse use of our mana than playing Abuelo and flickering the guide mural still. But it's definitely an option, and it could be really good on a future turn. Our opponent goes for one chump block. Cool with me. We're down to 13. We keep all of our dorks and get another 4-4. Four, four. And if they don't decommission the guide mural right now while we're tapped out, then they need to kill Abuelo, otherwise we can just threaten to double flicker to get around their decommission hammer. Decommission Hammer the Guide Mural definitely makes sense. They did tap their only flyer to do that, which means they probably have something they want to spend all the rest of their mana on, otherwise they would have just spent one more mana to move that hammer to a gnome. So they have three mana to spend on the defensive here. I mean, with Unlucky Drop and an Abuelo ability to be able to use, I don't think I'd really need to play around anything, because I've got two cards to protect my stuff. 12 life, so I need to be a little worried about their crack back, but I think I'm just jamming. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 power on the crack back, unless they have like the Malamet thing that gives plus 2, plus 1 to the whole board, they don't leave the crack back, and even then they'd have to survive this with keeping their whole board to do the crack back, so I think I send in the squad. Abuelo can make sure I have one untapped blocker. Unlucky Drop can make one of these blocks very favorable to me. I mean, this is already fine. I'm just going to keep Drop for whatever nonsense they try to do to kill me. Unless they respond with a removal spell, then I have an Unlucky Drop at the ready against their removal spell or combat trick. Cosmium Blast, my other 4-4. Four, four. Okay, so they're tapped out to just one mana here. So now I know Unlucky Drop on Envoy is going to be gross. And then I just flicker the Waylaying Pirates and stun the Guide Wing to keep another one of their blockers down. So they only have one mana up? Yeah, sure. Drop the Envoy. Put them down to six. Lock down a blocker again. I guess they are technically at nine with that Tinker's Tote available. And I guess there's an argument for just holding up Abuelo so they can't removal spell Pirates or Scout. But if they have any removal, they're just going to use it on Abuelo, so... I don't think I need to hold that up at instant speed. So they're at six now, taking four in the sky. Abuelo doesn't work till the end step. So I can't just like flicker pirates, stun the monster sword, and kill them or something like that. 
they are going to have blocks on the ground. So we just poke in the sky for four. Move on from there. Yeah, I don't think I need to get a, an explore counter on anything here. But I guess I have the mana to play the guide wing and double flicker and use the map, so we might as well. I guess if we get a fifth power on this, we can attack with that too, so we'll do that. Beautiful. Take the trade with the 5-5 five, five on the ground, and we put them to 2. Play the Guide Wing and have double flicker up. But I'll just use one right now and have one as a backup. Oh, I don't have an artifact on board. I'm a doofus. <laughs> Should have flickered the scout. Or just flickered nothing. Yeah, I think flicker nothing's actually better at that point since I don't have an artifact on board anymore. Just hold up the double flicker during their turn. So there's another guide wing. They have three blockers total. And there's the Sunborn. Send in their own guide wing. Um, I guess they're already dead on board because they don't have Tinkers towed up. But we can definitely take this trade. Yeah, I mean, they block one flyer and take two and die. Oh, unless they explore into exactly a planes for the tote. Oops, should not have taken the trade then. Playing a little loose here with these Abuelo nonsense plays. Oh my god, playing monstrously loose. I didn't know they already went to our end step. I had to put a stop because the way Arena works, I was meaning to do that in the main phase. Oh my god, what is my life right now? I mean, they have to chump both. I guess they don't have to chump Abuelo. Because they have the tote now. Alright, we missed Lethal. We are going to get another 2-2 flyer up on blocks and a map token after this. So we send both. It's probably chump with gnome. Go to three. Do I get to order these to get my map token before the pirates comes back? If I do, then it would be worth it to stun the Sunborn. Even losing the plus one plus one counters here. I think I've done enough loose lines here to not gamble on that. Working out how I want it to do. Alright, smart play from our opponent. Sack the tote to keep the guide wing so that they have two things to tap for the Sunborn to try to discover into the win. Auto choose replacement effects? No. Auto order triggered abilities? No. Okay, because they're holding the Sunborn off, I'm going to try to get this to go in the order I want it to, and we'll see if I can do that. Choose resolution order. This resolves first, then this. Yes. All right. We reversed the loose plays. A little bit by actually doing something moderately smart there. One of those perks of playing digital magic though, because in a paper game, the loosest play was using a boilo in the end step. In a paper game, I would just say the end of your main phase, or during your second main phase or whatever, when you move to pass from your main phase to the end step, you get an opportunity to use the ability before the beginning of their end step, and that is when I would use that. 
and you can just verbalize that in a paper game. But on Arena, if you don't manually put some stops here, sometimes it just goes. Or I just clicked the button too many times. That happens a lot too. I just clicked the button once too many times. It's probably more accurate. All right, let's keep track of some of their instants here while they're thinking. If we do go to a game three, they have a Cosmium Blast here. So Cosmium Blast and Dread Mazai are the only instants that I remember seeing right now. Our opponent decides that pass turn is their best bet. Five, six, seven, eight. Let's just hold up a triple flicker if we need it. Just make really sure I don't accidentally go to my end step if I want to do any flickering during my turn. Four damage on board. Cosmium Blast the Abuelo to go to one life is the play. Can't protect Abuelo. Abuelo won't exile himself. So now we're killing a guide wing. And they keep a Sunborn that might have a counter on it, but they go to one. Guess if we explored here, that would be the way to try to find the kill. But I wanted the, the triple Boilo. That was loose again, because there actually isn't... I don't have three permanents, two triple Boilo. But I guess the idea was that I could do it twice now and then have one up during their turn. Alright, they've got two Cosmium Blast in there. That's their main removal. Okay. Do I stun the Sunborn and let them keep the Guide Wing? Or do I kill the Guide Wing? Let them have a Sunborn on an empty board? I think we just let them Sunborn on an empty board. We put them to one. They have to find flying or removal for our scout. Off of the Hidden Volcano or the Sunborn. So I imagine they explore that to the bottom. Or to the graveyard. They do. Yeah, and they're going to have to just crack Hidden Volcano at this point. Alright, let's see if we would have won if I just used the map. Nope. Alright, luckily that punch didn't matter because we've got a million lands. Alright, R and Jesus. See if it works out for them. They find a Sunshot Militia, which does not kill us and does not block the Waterwind Scout. And it looks like, despite my best efforts... The game has been decided. The player on the play has won every game this round so far, as I imagined. Hopefully we can buck that trend going into game three, playing with Abuelo much tighter than we did that game. Pretty lucky to have been that far ahead for the end step Abuelo punt. I need to keep track of what phase of the turn that we're in, which can be a little bit... Uh, a little bit easy to lose track of on Arena. It's not the most obvious thing in the world. we got to look at those little symbols really closely to not just completely hose ourselves with our Boilo abilities. So let's tighten that up for sure. But it's the same deck we're, we're running back in this matchup for sure. And we just hope that the play draw advantage does not steamroll us again for game three. See how it all pans out as we head into the final game of round number three. It's a little slower than I would prefer here. We do have a blunder for their early threat. We've got good card draw on the Iceberg. Great late game with Iceberg Mural. I think because of the blunder, I'm going to keep it, but it obviously has that chance to get steamrolled if they have a great opener. And turn one Guidewing is definitely a great opener for now. See if they curve out alongside it, though. That'll be the real determining factor. If it's just Guidewing into like a three drop, it's fine. Oh, God. Just double guide wing here, sure. And we have hit land, land. Waterwind scout, though. We do find a flyer for turn three that's big enough to block these guide wings. Down to 17. Do they have the three drop to follow through? They do. And it's a scythe claw raptor, which is really gross. Um. Even if they have their removal, their cards like Dreadmaw's Iron and Cosmium Blast 
they can get around Abuelo's ward. They play one land, and then they kill Abuelo on the block with Cosmium Blast, so... We play the Waterwind Scout over the Abuelo here, because either is going to die to that Cosmium Blast if they have it. Either is going to die to the Dreadmaw's Ire. Probably have to Sorcery Speed Brackish Blunder the Scythe Claw Raptor to not take four to the face. Maybe use like double map token on the Waterwind Scout if it's still around. Iron Paw Aspirant to buff up one of the Guide Wings means a free attack with one of those. Here's the block here. If they have Dreadmaw's Ire, the game is completely over, even if I don't block, so let's do the best we can. Cosmium Blast, okay, that's fine. Nowhere near as bad as Dreadmaw's Ire would be. Now I can Abuelo and try to get a counter on it, but again, I think this is just play, dot, play draw differential. Being able to curve out all this nonsense. We just now get our fourth mana. Mm. Might be too slow. I mean, 2-3 or a 1-2 on the ground doesn't do anything. So we have to go... Yeah, Abuelo make it a 3-3 block there. Take 5-6. Go to 5 life. Hope that this is nothing. They've got one card in their hand they can't deploy. Ideally. This is also hoping for a non-land, but the ratio is kind of in our favor at this point. 37% of our deck being lands. So, a good portion less than half. That's a weighted coin flip in our favor, and Guidewing's a good draw. You can play Guidewing, Scout, and Blunder to get big blocks going next turn. Not big blocks, but blocks, period. Alright, take the four from the Raptor. They do still have follow-ups, though. Enterprising Scallywag, and that... Is everything. That's the whole hand on board. Can we stabilize things from here? I can blunder the raptor to force them to recast it next turn while playing a guide wing and a scout for now. That's going to supply me with a 1-1 one, one to block their 1-1 one, one flyer, a 3-3 three, three to block their 2-2 two, two flyer, and potentially a 2-3 on the ground. That would mean no attacks for them next turn. I think we do go for it. And then we're going to try to Guide Mural Abuelo combo into getting ahead. Please non-land on top again. 38% land, so still in our favor. And it's a Petrify? Okay, that's a great draw. Send in that Guide Wing. That <laughs> looks like uh, Dreadmaw's Ire or Cosmium Blast off the top. Oh, that is so rough. If it's Dreadmaw's Ire, double block is much better. If it's Cosmium Blast, double block is much worse. If I single block and they Dreadmaw's Ire, they're just killing my Iceberg here. And my Abuelo. If I double block and they Cosmium Blast, I have no Flyers left and they still have both of them, I think I have to solo block here and hope that Abuelo just gets Cosmium Blasted. I could also not block, but then if they... Oh lord. Then if they Dreadmaw's Iron at 3, which means them hitting the Sunshot Militia at any point is just insta-death. God. This is so bad. No matter what it is, I don't have favorable blocks. Let's see what they top decked here. Please, Cosmium Blast. Oh my god. That's probably the best draw on their deck. It's pretty horrible for us. Now we have to petrify a guide wing and hope that ours can be a 2 2. Seems like the only line we've got here. We are hitting hard on these explorers.
I think I have to play a 4-4 four four so I have something to trade into the Raptor. I mean, I can greed it up because we've been getting so lucky and just try to hit the land to play Guide Mural 2. Um, but that's a little too greedy, I think. Instead of just guaranteeing something on board to trade with the Raptor. Tolly's favor for plus one plus one trample. And they find deconstruction hammer. So they can blow up my guide mural. And I can't single block the raptor anymore. They can also just blow up my 4-4 four, four blocker. Good lord, that is bad for me. I mean, if they just straight attack with it, it's not that bad, because I double block with 4-4-2-3, four, four, but that means that, like, Scallywag gets in if they attack all or something. Favor into Hammer was very, very good here. Just for clearing out 4-4 four, four blockers. Or the Petrify, even, would be pretty gross. Yeah, no, that's not good at all. Okay. Get your free two damage in, I guess. Down to four. They still hitting all non lands here? Yep. Made it to five mana and stop drawing lands. It's rough. Well, we get one four four off the guide mural. That's probably better than just drawing a card right now. Even if it leads into a six six next turn, I think I need a four four right now with how the game is going. Let's get a four four right now. And then they could decommission the Petrify, but that would mean that we get to keep the Guide Mural if they do that. Although decommission Petrify is enough to get in the sky, and also they could just put two, or not decommission, deconstruct. They could put two deconstruction hammers on the Guide Wing and just get through our Guide Wing, regardless. Just start attacking with a 3-3 Flying Vigilance each turn, and that's also more than enough to close out the game with how low we are after their aggressive start. Looks like they just hit another non-land. Yep, double hammer. Go to one or chump block. Go to one it is. So I've got an opportunity to find a way to kill the guide wing. We have two draws to do it. Our top deck and our iceberg. Okay, they did hit a land, but it's a hidden volcano. Okay, well now my guide wing trades into theirs. Okay, I'm done drawing lands. Iceberg, find me an on land, please. Well, you found me a non land, you just shoved it in my graveyard, which I didn't like. Six six on the ground. Which can just get blown up by their hammer. One life I 100% can't afford to attack. With anything that doesn't have Vigilance. So now they just start cracking Hidden Volcanoes if they hit more lands, and if they don't, they're just casting whatever they draw. Hidden Volcano it is. Discovers the Kaparakti Sunborn. Oh no. Oh no. Hey, Guidewing. We have to trade, friend. Oh. I mean, if they don't attack, then we don't have to trade. I guess they're waiting for the treasure off the Scallywags so they can blow up the Titan or something. Maybe? Alright, yeah, we have to trade. And then they can just decommission hammer my Petrify next turn and win. But I don't have any other line. 
Wow, and they ripped the Cosmium Blast, too. So they did draw an on land, they just had enough treasure tokens to crack a volcano and play the Blast. Absolutely filthy. Doesn't super matter where this goes. That does not save me at all. Well, that is how it's going to be. Super unfortunate round here. I think our matchup was really, really even. And I think my initial assessment was very correct. Where every one of these games just 100% came down to who was on the play. And if you flip that around in any of these three games, I think the outcome can easily change. To where we could have won round one if we were on the play. They could have won round one if they were on the play in game two. Or sorry, they could have won game two if they were on the play in that game. And then we could have won this game if we were on the play here, because we would have had a lot more breathing room. Higher life total overall, dropping our three drops while they're still playing two mana stuff. Stuff like that. We would have had like just enough time to like not have to make that Abuelo block early and try to grind out extra value that way. Just little stuff like that stacks up a lot with the play draw differential. So, two and one it is, and we are going to have to find a victory in the final round if we want to get into another draft. So, fingers crossed. Hopefully, we can get there. Uh, we can also tighten up our plays quite a bit, but luckily for us, I think the only game where I played loose was <laughs> the game that we won anyway. I don't think game one or... Game three, we could have played that much better, and it definitely wouldn't have impacted the course of the game regardless. I mean, we could have done the double block against the Mire, in which case we would have no flyers left against their Guidewing, and we would have just died quicker, I think, even. If I had done the double block there. And if I did the no block to go down to three, I think I also probably just die a little quicker. Maybe still having a boiler works out, even at the three life. I don't know. It's interesting to look back on. But I think the biggest determining factor for sure is who's on the play in a matchup like that. So, 2-1, and one, heading into the final battle, hoping to find a third round win to get into day two, draft number two. Fingers are crossed here as we head into that final boss. Here we are for the final round. Unfortunately, if it does go to three games, we're going to be on the draw for two of them. So that is definitely a disadvantage to start it off, but our opening hand is phenomenal with Spyglass Siren into Hammer into Abuelo. Definitely happy to keep this hand, and it would be insane on the play. So there's Arazka Puzzle Door to start things off from our opponent. Here is the Spyglass Siren, so we can start jamming in for two with it next turn off of the Hammer. Blue-red from our opponent. Really scary matchup. If it's open in their draft pod, it is by far the strongest strategy in the format. If they have a couple copies of Captain Storm, that card is completely busted. Two mana, two, two, that puts a plus one, plus one counter onto one of their pirates every time an artifact enters the battlefield under their control. And as you can see, even just from our deck, that's going to happen a lot. With Spyglass Siren spitting out a map, with Deconstruction Hammer, stuff like that. So our opponent is either playing full control... Or they have a Cogwork Wrestler in hand. And I believe they probably have a Cogwork Wrestler in hand. Luckily for us, it doesn't play well against this hand. It doesn't really do anything. Yeah, it's going to shut off two points of damage, but it's not going to kill any of our creatures like it normally can do. So they do have that Cogwork Wrestler as an instant speed trick to keep in mind. And they are blue, red, and white. All of the artifact colors overlapping for a lot of synergy there. There's a Market Gnome on the ground. Luckily, again, on the ground being the really important words meaning we get to keep jamming in in the sky which i will do with abuelo on the board turn three turn four from our opponent and they're just going to pass the turn holding four mana up so they could have like saw blades they're going to do here to shoot abuelo for uh 
for five and then have that to craft later. That'd be pretty disgusting. They then craft it with the market gnome. I mean, I can't really play around that unless I just choose to never attack with Abuelo, and it's not like my Abuelo synergies are that insane in this hand anyway. So I think we just get Abuelo to knock out one of their removal spells. Interesting. Oh, I guess they just don't instantly slam it. Okay, no, they do take all the damage at least. So I can Waylay Pirates to stun the Gnome and jam in for three on the ground, or I can save the Pirates to maybe lock down a Flyer later. I think if they play a Flyer, we'll just unlucky drop it. Let's stay mana efficient and jam out a little attacker on the ground to lock down the Market Gnomes. They don't have the free Chump block that also gains them a life. Okay, they held four mana up and did nothing with it. We're happy to see that. They do have the Mythic Uncommon, though, the Captain Storm. That I am very unhappy with, to the point of probably just unlucky dropping that. Let's cash in a map token first for a potential extra point of damage, unless they have one mana removal. Find another Waylaying Pirates, which is a beautiful pickup. So what are they going to do here? They're going to Cogwork Wrestler my Pirates down to a 1-3, but then I unlucky drop in response. Yeah, no, we've got great attacks with Unlucky Drop. Double block the pirates. I mean, I'm not going to do anything if they don't do anything. I'll just kill Captain Storm here. That's fine with me. Okay, we kill Captain Storm and save the Unlucky Drop for their next threat. I could alternatively play Sunscribe and Iceberg. If I play Iceberg, I mill this Waylaying Pirates, though, and it's a pretty great draw, so let's just hold the four up for the unlucky drop. Trumpeting Carnosaur. Terrible target for unlucky drop, because if they redraw it, they discover five again. Keep that in mind as instant speed removal as well. Three mana for three to a creature, Planeswalker. If they don't hit a flyer, we're still winning this game. Hit for five, two turns in a row, and they're dead. They do hit a Petrify, though. Seems good. And Unlucky Drop can't get rid of the Petrify. I guess our Decommission Hammer can. Okay, so they're going to put it on the Spyglass Siren, interestingly. That is not a great choice. Oh wait, Abuelo has Ward. Oh my god, because Abuelo has Ward, they do not have a good... I'm going to put it full control so it doesn't auto go to their end step here, because that'd be horrible for me. Uh, but yeah, they actually just don't have a good target, because I can just flicker the Siren, and they can't target Abuelo. Okay. This is main phase two now. Yeah, flicker the Siren. Get it back in the end step. Abuelo's ability actually coming in super hot. Completely wasn't even thinking of that, but it is actually incredible here. I have to jam into five, jam in four, five to threaten lethal here. So we got to equip the hammer and hold up the unlucky drop or equip the hammer and play the pirates just to stun the carnosaur. Yeah, re-equip the hammer to guarantee the five. They're dead in two swings in the sky still. Even if they gain one from the market gnome. Let's get another threat on board. Let's tap out for the pirates and stun this Carnosaur. I think that's fine. All right, beautiful stuff. We start the game off 1-0, and and we won while we were on the draw, which is excellent. That means we will get a game on the play to potentially win even if our opponent's on the play game too. All right, once again, you don't mess with perfection. I think the starting build of this deck's beautiful. I think it's the best build we have. Our opponent's got a sick bomb with the Carnosaur, so being able to counter that would be okay. But the problem is, as you've seen how all these games play out, we just never have the five mana untapped to be able to counter it anyway. So Hurl into History ends up basically just being a mulligan. So... Yeah, I mean, if they hit that, it's going to be bad. We've got some ways to stun it. I don't like putting that back in their deck, but I do like Unlucky Drop against Captain Storm and stuff still. 
but maybe some dorky card draw spell or combat trick is better than the unlucky drop. This is the first matchup I actually think unlucky drop is maybe the weakest card in the deck. Although our last matchup was somewhat similar, with them being kind of low curve and a lot of enter the battlefield effects. But let's just jam it in again. See if we can't get the the two shot, the two wins in a row to wrap this event up. We are on the draw here, obviously wanting to draw non-lands. If we flood out, we can still use the cave to put some counters on the siren. Definitely worth considering a mulligan here. But I want to keep the inherent card advantage of sticking at a seven card hand. So I'm going to take a bit of a risk here. Just try to keep as many cards as possible. So there's the Iron Paw Aspirant, turn two from our opponent to just start rolling in with a two mana, two, three. Could immediately petrify that just to slow them down, but let's just drop the Oak and Siren here. Jam in for two, down to 18. There's a Shipwreck Sentry for a 3-3. Three, three. Could eat that with Piranhas and kill it with the Oaken Siren. I think that's reasonable. Unfortunately, we've drawn a couple more lands here, which is really bad. Okay, they didn't even play an artifact, so they don't get to attack with the Sentry. Aspirant putting in work here. It's gonna do most of their damage at this point. Oh my lord. Alright. Oak for one again. Cycle the Brine Fang to guarantee their fifth mana. Here's an Oaken Siren of their own. Three mana up for their own tricks. Let's just see if the Eden by Piranhas resolves. And if it resolves, I'll get the kill on the sentry here. Okay. It does resolve. Well, at least Sunscribe's not a land. Are we just bouncing Oak and Sirens off each other forever? Probably better than petrifying their siren. Like they land cycled this brine fang, so they've got something expensive in hand. Having the petrify for that is probably pretty important. The belligerent. Okay, yeah, we'll petrify that so it doesn't just insta win the game, letting them cast everything off the top of their deck. So they can play a land, and then if they hit a bunch of spells in a row, they cast a million cards that turn. Cool. And Waterwind Scout can let us buff the siren to be big enough to beat theirs without even. Uh, Cracking the Captivating Cave. I'm pretty happy with that. Let's make sure the Petrify resolves first. It does. I mean, they couldn't have anything for a blue and a white, I think, in this format. Anyway. Well. No counter there, but we do draw into a Spyglass Siren, which is wonderful. Thank you, Sunscribe. Very cool. There's Captain Storm. Luckily, Petrify doesn't work against Captain Storm anyway, so... Not like we should have held Petrify for that. That is a really big deal, though. Captain Storm plus the Oaken Siren. It's not exactly good for us. So I've got the mana to Spyglass Siren, use the map, and crack the Captivating Cave here, so that's probably the line. We're hoping to get Scout to 3-3, so both of these are big enough to attack into the Siren for now. I suppose we should play around Cogwork Wrestler being their last card in hand. Which would make their Siren a 3-4. So in that case, we actually want to stack it all up on one thing. I don't know. Even two counters makes this big enough to be fine. Ooh. Draw Waylaying Pirates? Okay. Well, it insta-went to blocks here, which kind of looks like no tricks. Uh-oh. 
Okay. I was going to say, they stopped for a second. If they had a Cogwork Wrestler, that'd be a free kill on the water when scouting. That'd be horrible. Because they get the counter on the Sire and it's a 3-4. And our scout's a 1-3. But since it just insta-went to combat, do a little tiny bit of Arena cheaty facing there a little. Assume that means no instance that Arena's trying to hold priority for. Ooh, wow. Their deck is just mythic uncommons the deck. Captain Storm and Kaparokti Sunborn. Send in the 2-3. So now they are just telling us that they have the Cogwork Wrestler. So they minus 2. The, if I double block like this, if they minus 2, we still have 3 power. Yeah, we don't block. So, I mean, I just stun the Siren, hit for 7, and try to kill them in one more swing. This is their last opportunity to play the Cogwork Wrestler to stop some damage. They don't do it. Alright, I just need to not take 10, and then they're probably dead. Maybe they didn't have the Cogwork Wrestler, and that was just a genius bluff with the Aspirant. Alright, one card in their hand to turn this game around. They do have the random hit off the Sunborn. They can tap Belligerent and a Market Gnome. Hit a Cogwork Wrestler, which gets another plus one, plus one counter. Actually, I think they probably should have put that in their hand so they could actually stop some flying damage next turn. Not that it would be stopping enough damage, but it would be closer to maybe giving them another turn. But we'll see. Maybe they find a kill out of nowhere here by doing it this way instead. Maybe they've got the untap trick for the Oaken Siren, and that's why they're choosing to buff that. Down to six. One card in their hand. Soaring Sandwing. Oh my god, the game three? Oh god. Wow, is that bad. As is our draw. I mean, Guidewing's good early, but not here. Now the Sunborn just pops off another turn. They're going to untap the Siren next turn. God dang it. I guess we got to go... We had to go Pirates and Siren on the Sunborn. What I don't like about that is, like, then if their last card's, like, a Dreadmaw's Eye or something, we just get completely demolished. But it was that Soaring Sandwing. Let me add that to the list of things if we go to another game, which we might here, because their board is really good at surviving now and we're only at six they don't have any trample if i send in three things and have three blockers up block 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 i take one two three well, actually no send in three attack everybody i block the four i block the four i block the three i take one two three four five if they top deck an artifact i die i guess the siren is vigilance right so it's going to stay untapped so we'll actually have one more blocker than it looks. Yeah, we have to send all in. Put them to two and try to find a kill in one more swing after this. Find another piece of interaction to tap one of the flyers. Hope they draw dead for one turn. But the Sunborn guarantees a discover of some kind. Ah. Come on, R and Jesus. Don't fail me now. Draw land and then discover something not great. Just like a ground creature of some kind. God, the card quality here is actually nuts. Another Oaken Siren too? Yeah. It's an incredibly premium card. You got it. Watch, now they're going to have the combat trick to completely blow me out. Now that I'm actually choosing to block this time. Nope. Alright. Well, at least the Sunborn's gone. Wailing Pirates. Is enough to put them to one, but one is not zero. 
stun an oak and siren if they miss on their draw step and we hit another piece of interaction we can win that's the only bet now pirates into our bounce spell or something next turn Two, three, four, five. If I attack with anybody that's non vigilance, I just die. Yeah, they have to draw dead, and then we have to draw gas at this point. Final two draw steps their final draw step, and then if we somehow survive, our final draw step. Okay. If they have nothing in hand, and we draw removal or bounce, we win. It's our last draw of the game, because if we don't, then we're dead. They have one more attacker than we have blockers. Yeah, that'll do. I need to spend the one mana to equip first. I'm getting way ahead of myself. We have to go for it, because if I don't do anything with this hammer here and I pass the turn, then we're dead on board. Six attackers to five blockers. Let's see what that last card is. It does not save them. Oh my god, we almost lost that game. And it was due to our early decisions here. And I didn't go over the decision too much because I didn't think it would end up mattering so much, but it was an early decision to not block the Sunborn. Well, early, quote-unquote. Um, early because of how much longer the game went after that, which I really wasn't expecting. That Sandwing was huge for our opponent with that life gain. So really, it was that decision to not go for the blocks on the Sunborn. The reason is, either if they had a combat trick, or if they had nothing, it would be better to not block. Um, or I guess, no, a combat trick or a removal spell. So if they had a removal spell, our, our block on board, I think, I'll have to look back on it. Maybe we had a block that could kill it with just ground troops, in which case I absolutely should have just done that. But I think the only block we had that could actually kill the Sunborn would put like our Oaken Siren or something at risk to lose a little bit of our flying damage. In which case, if we went for that and they had a removal spell follow-up, then they kill one of our flyers with that and then removal spell another flyer to stick around in this game and get more draw steps to draw out of it. And if they had a combat trick and I did that kind of block, it would have been really bad where they kill uh, one of our flyers and get some extra damage and keep the Sunborn on board. But if they had a big flyer that gains them life to stabilize them to where even if I keep all my flyers, they still don't die on the next swing. That plays real bad, because just buying them one more turn to be able to discover three at least twice that game was huge, huge, huge value. So that block really didn't work out for us. And I'm interested in looking back on that and seeing if I if I really did have like a solid block that didn't even put a flyer at risk, because if I did, that was absolutely a punt. If my only way to kill this was to block in a way where we trade a flyer into it, then um, then it is definitely debatable. Obviously, in hindsight, it would have worked better to actually just take the trade there. But um, yeah, really interesting stuff there. I thought for sure we were just getting there this game because we were in such a good position for a while. But they almost pulled it right back with the Sunborn into the Sandwing. Really, really solid stuff from our opponent. We've had some fierce competition today, but we have gotten really, really solidly lucky overall. And that is going to lead into a three-win run, guaranteeing that we get to play in the Arena Open Day 2 
draft number two, which is really, really cool. We'll take another look at our deck and then discuss day two, draft two a little bit before we end the video. But uh, overall, really, really happy with this result. I don't think there's much I could have done in the one round that we lost. Obviously, I did play pretty poorly, but that was almost all concentrated in the game that we won anyway. I do think a lot of that round was up to uh, whoever was on the play there. And there were also mulligan decisions that could have gone differently. I did keep a pretty slow hand, but we drew into a reasonably quick hand that would have been an auto keep anyway. So the mulligan decision didn't pan out poorly for us, but it might have been a pretty risky one. So one final look at the deck. Again, I think this is really solid. This is probably your average blue-white deck where it lands. It's not like insane. It's not terrible at all. It's just perfectly solid, perfectly reasonable. This is kind of where you want to end up with your blue-white decks. I think this is a deck I'd be happy to have drafted in any premier draft, traditional draft, anything like that. Pretty standard blue-white stuff today, and all of our cards got to see a little bit of play, do a lot of work for us, especially, again, the cards you see a lot in this format, the efficient little flyers that give you extra card advantage or map tokens or something like that. So really cool stuff from the deck. Really happy to have gotten a deck this solid in an arena open draft like this, and it panned out quite well for us with some very solid luck and a very solid deck. So three and one it is. That is going to give us the prize of the open day two draft two token. So tomorrow's video is going to be the arena open day two draft number two, where there's up to $2,000 in cash prizes on the line. But since we did get a loss in our first draft, that means we're playing until one match loss. It is not a Swiss draft like the first one. The first one, even if you lose every single round, you get to play all four rounds, so you get to play a lot of magic no matter what. Day two draft two, though, if we lose that first round, we are gone. Luckily, we get 5,000 gems no matter what, so we get all the gems that I spent on the Arena Open day one back, but it would be a little disappointing to only get to play one match of Magic with our next deck, so we'll be fighting really hard in the day two draft number two, hoping to at least cash out a little bit of cash prizes, but we'll definitely see how that all goes tomorrow. Very, very excited for that event. But that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching the video. If you enjoyed this video and you are interested in seeing my other videos like day two draft number two, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more of these videos in your recommended feed. You can also catch me live at the Twitch channel in the link in the description below or support the channel directly at the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.